A record number of migrants are being arrested at the U.S. southern border, while politicians don't see eye to eye on how to solve that problem. Hello, I'm Arnold Knight, and that is The Heat. The issue of immigration reform is also having a huge impact on foreign policy in the United States, specifically funding for Ukraine and Israel. Republicans are trying to force Democrats to agree to stricter immigration rules as a condition to approve foreign aid packages. The number of migrants showing up at the border between Mexico and the United States is rising to record numbers. CGTN's Nathan King reports. It's often said that the United States is a nation of immigrants, and in 2023, this is truer than ever. In October 2023, the foreign-born share of the U.S. population was 49.5 million people. That's 15 percent of the population, the highest in U.S. history. Congratulations. While the vast majority of immigrants in the U.S. arrive legally, illegal immigration is also surging. And that's a big political problem, especially for U.S. President Joe Biden in a re-election year. Fiscal year 2023 saw over 2 million migrant apprehensions on the U.S. southern border with Mexico, only the second time since records began that the U.S. Border Patrol stopped that many migrants. And American voters are paying attention. According to a recent poll by the U.S. network NBC, Border security and immigration rank third on issues that motivates voters, with nearly 75% of Americans wanting to see more money go towards strengthening the border with Mexico. That's higher than the percentage that want to see more funding for Israel and Ukraine. And here in Washington, those issues are now inextricably linked. The motion is not agreed to. Last week, Republican members of the U.S. Senate blocked a bill that would have sent around $50 billion in assistance to Ukraine. The Republicans want to link that aid money to stricter immigration, including more money for border protection and toughening up asylum rules to exclude more people. They are going to have to grant significant concessions on the border to pass the president's supplemental uh, aid package. And certainly the House of Representatives will demand that. And until they accept that reality, the legislation will not pass. Democrats, who have traditionally resisted tougher immigration rules, are now open to some sort of compromise. Not just because the White House wants the aid sent to Ukraine before the end of this year, but also because many Democrat-controlled cities, including New York and Chicago, are struggling with a surge in immigrants, stretching public resources and voter patience. I am willing to make significant compromises on the border. We need to fix the broken border system. It is broken. And thus far, I've gotten no response. Front-running Republican nominee for President Donald Trump made immigration a central focus of his first term in the White House. We had the most secure border in our history. Now we have the most unsecure border in the history. Pledging to build a wall on the southern border. Why do we want he issued temporary bans on immigration from many Muslim-majority countries. A second term could see him try to enact even more stringent restrictions. Immigration, both legal and illegal, will play a central role in the upcoming general election here in the U.S. And the Republicans are really thinking that the issue could help put them back in the White House. Meanwhile, Democrats have a choice. Do they respond to public concerns and risk alienating their democratic base, which generally has a more positive attitude of immigration and its long-term effect on U.S. society. Nathan King, CGTN, just outside the White House. Okay, let's bring in our panel to talk about this here in Washington, D.C. Laura Colson is director of the Americas program. Mark Krikorian is executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies. Rafael Bernal is a staff writer for The Hill. And from Eagleville in Tennessee, Alan Orr is former president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Welcome to all of you. Laura, as we just heard in that report, there have been massive numbers of people being arrested uh, at the border. In fact, it's record numbers. And if we look at a comparison, for instance, if we look at the period in the 2010s, 
that was a relatively low number of people being apprehended uh, at the border. But now it's over 2 million. So what's behind these numbers? Well, you know, I'm usually based in Mexico City, and uh, we've been watching the flows coming up through Mexico onto the border. There's a couple things we have to be clear about, though. This is not a record number of people. This is a record number of apprehensions. Mm -hmm. There's a significant percentage of those that are recurrent apprehensions. So what you're seeing is that the specific types of policies that are being applied at the border are causing people to accumulate on the border, to be able to pass over and and have uh, immigration hearings and make a case, especially for asylum, for many of those people, are the, they're asylum seekers from various countries. Uh, and so they're, and people are going back and forth. So when we talk about a surge, we're not talking about an invasion of huge numbers of people. Even when we talk about northern cities, which was mentioned, mm -hmm. seeing these large numbers of migrants, it turns out it's because Republican governors are sending busloads up there to create media spectacles, and then and the cities are not prepared for this type of arrival in large numbers. So we have to break down what exactly is happening. Happening. As to why people are coming, uh, it's interesting because there's been a recent report, you know, the migra migratory flows have changed considerably. We had a period when they were primarily Mexican, and then we had a huge increase from Northern Triangle countries, so-called, which are Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador. And now what we're seeing is this huge increase in uh, refugees, in asylum seekers and migrants from Venezuela and Cuba, and uh, and we're seeing a lot of other countries as well, but those are the ones that have really seen a spike. If you look at what's in common with Venezuela and, and Cuba, it's U.S. sanctions. The Venezuelan economy with the 2017 sanctions that were primarily affecting the population um, lost 37 percent of GDP according to a recent report. The sanctions that were toughened on Cuba have also caused increased human suffering. No parent is going to sit around and watch their child starve. Mm -hmm. And so when it gets to that point, and largely as a result of these sanctions, there are many other factors as well, mm -hmm. then we begin to see these increases in migration. So what the United States has to do if they really want to solve this, instead of playing this macho game of who can be tougher yeah. on migrants, uh, who are desperate people who are fleeing violence, who are fleeing, fleeing poverty, who are fleeing star starvation in many cases, is to start saying, well, what's wrong with our own policies that have caused an increase in migration, yeah. in forced migration out of these countries? Mark, uh, many of those who are arriving at the border are seeking asylum here in the United States. And what Republicans are saying is that those rules to grant asylum need to be tightened. It needs to be far harder to get asylum in the United States. Um, I mean, will that succeed? Uh, it will at some point. Let's see if it happens in these negotiations. But it's important to clarify, very few of these people are seeking asylum. They're seeking to apply for asylum. Right. Because when they apply, they are then let go. And that is what is drawing this flow of people. The graph that you showed earlier a dramatic change with a change in administrations. And that's not because somehow things got worse anywhere. Uh, you know, sanctions in Colombia, in uh, Venezuela, for instance, Venezuelan economy has been wrecked by the socialists over the past 20 years. The large majority of people who are Venezuelans, for instance, who are coming to the border were already settled in other countries. They were living in Colombia, Peru, Ecuador. They had jobs. The opportunity to come here is what has drawn people, because all of these people have smartphones. They all are rationally weighing the odds, the costs, and the benefits. And under this administration, the odds of being let go are now so high if you come across the border and turn yourself in. The odds of being let go are so high that it's worth it. It's worth undertaking the expense and the risk, because there is risk involved traveling through Mexico, dealing with these smugglers, it's worth trying to upgrade. I mean, that's the way to put it, quite frankly. One of our uh, analysts spoke, for instance, with a Haitian who was passing through Costa 
Puerto Rico on the way north to the U.S. border. And this yeah. young man had moved to Chile years ago, something like eight or nine years ago. And um, he said life in Chile was 100 times better than in Haiti. And so our analyst asked him, well, why did you leave? Why are you going to the United States? And the guy kind of smiled, chuckled a little, and said, life's a million times better in the United States. And that was true before the Biden administration took over. But with the Biden administration's rollback of almost all of Trump's policies, not even Trump's policies, even earlier policies under Obama have been yeah. reversed. Mark, the what about is uh, a Mark, huge flow of people. Yeah. Mark, what about Laura's point that uh, U.S. policy towards these countries, like Venezuela, like Cuba, is contributing to the flows that we are seeing? It probably does contribute to some degree to the desire to, to the desire to leave, but the desire to leave always has to match up with the likelihood of actual success, of yeah. being able to get away with it. And we're getting people from a lot of other countries. We're getting people from Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan and Cameroon and all kinds of places where U.S. policy doesn't play a significant yeah. role. And frankly, even if U.S. policy played a role, yeah. change the policy. The idea, it's not as though we have to take anyone who wants to move right. here from these countries because of our policies. Alan, uh, the asylum system uh, is, by most accounts, overwhelmed right now. Many of those seeking asylum will have to wait for years to get adjudication on these applications. One study says the U.S. will have to double the number of immigration judges, hiring up to 700 more. Um, but there are those critics of the current system who say that that asylum system is being abused. What is your view on that? Uh, I don't, I mean, I think there's abuse in all systems, right? So I can basically say that there aren't some asylum cases that aren't worthy, but that's why we have the adjudication process. And the problem isn't in the numbers, the problem's in the process. We spend $17 doing a border or hiring a border protection to each $1 we spend on an immigration court. So why not let's balance that out and get people through the process so that we know if they have a valid asylum case or not. That's why people are released because they're waiting adjudication of their claim that takes years and years and years. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a fiction of breaking the system, as well as there's a great migration happening around the world. So people are going to all great places. And one of the biggest challenges we have in this country is the Republican Party that stands on television every day and says the southern border is open. It's an advertisement. Just show up and come through. And that's every tape the cartel uses to have people sort of move to the border to think they can get through. So the risk isn't related to the probability of success. It's related to the actual words coming from people who hold powers a position within our own country. And we need migrants. Our population is dwindling. Mm -hmm. So what we need is a better system. Our system's outdated. And asylum, ending asylum is not going to cure our immigration problem. Right now, Congress is focusing on making most legal ways illegal. Increasing the, limiting the ways an individual can come here is not going to decrease the number of undocumented people here. It's only going to increase it. Rafael Benal, what uh, impact is immigration having on uh, President Biden's political standing. I mean, there was a recent poll that showed that 63 percent of Americans disapprove of the way in which he's handling the immigration issue. Um, I mean, is this issue big enough to hurt him in the election? I mean, it certainly doesn't help him. And Republicans have been very, very effective at uh, what Alan was just saying, talking about open borders. And yes, there is an element of self-fulfilling prophecy in why people are coming, certainly. But the, the, the perception of Biden as someone who is not willing to engage in the kind of cruelty that Trump was willing to engage, whether that's a reality or just a perception, you know, every everybody will, uh, people will argue differently. But that's also... Create, it helps people think the Americans are not going to shoot at me, are not going to throw me back into Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this politically, um, it, it obviously, the numbers hurt Biden. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that Biden has sort of accepted the Republican narrative hurts him with his own base. Yeah, Rafael, uh, just, right one point, uh, just one point uh, on the policies that were implemented by former President Donald Trump and the ones that have been implemented by President Biden. I mean, would it be fair to say that Biden kept in place many of the policies that Donald Trump initially introduced? Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of it is perception. Uh, Title 42 was really just an ineffective policy, and that actually did cause the, uh, the, the re-incidence of, of crossings. Um, it, 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 you know, but it didn't 
it really stopped the flow of migrants when Title 42 went away. There was there was a lull because because the smugglers were getting readjusted mm -hmm. to the new reality. But uh, but it's re they're really all perception. Yeah. All of Trump's policies, in fact, have not been proven to work. Uh, the because you you have the pandemic in the middle that really skews all statistics. If you go back to the Obama administration and, and Bush earlier on, with the same laws that Biden has right now, yeah. with a different flow of migrants, they had much more success in keeping keeping people right. away. And I just want to get to one more point about the political impact of this. I mean, it's become a political blame game. Uh, you know, we hear the Republicans are to blame for this. The Republicans say the Democrats are to blame for this. Here's the Republican Senator Lindsey Graham talking about it. Let's listen to some of what he had to say. We're urging the president to get involved and fix this problem. Senator Murphy's a fine fellow. But it's never going to happen as long as Senator Schumer is in charge of these negotiations. We're going to have to get the President of the United States involved. He owes it to the American people to fix a broken border. Is that fair criticism, uh, Rafael, that the President is not personally vested in fixing this? I mean, Lindsey Graham is setting a pretty good trap there for the for the president, and the president is walking right into it. Yeah. Uh, he w apparently wants to walk into it. Is it fair criticism that he's not sufficiently vested? I think it'd be fair criticism to say that Biden has never really liked immigration as an issue, has never really liked the border as an issue, is probably less of an expert on that than on sort of geopolitical right. thinking about what's going on in Ukraine. So is he going to prioritize it enough? I don't think even either the right or the left thinks that, that Biden, right. uh, you know, has his head on right on immigration. Laura, I want to get back to something you were talking about earlier on, and that is we see uh, some states, um, Texas for one, Florida another, sending migrants from those states to Democrat-controlled cities, cities like New York, like Chicago. But now we're also seeing opposition in those cities, those Democrat-controlled cities, and in those states, from governors, from mayors. I mean, how significant is that kind of opposition which is taking place at local government level. I think it's it's very significant because it's helping push this narrative that immigration to the United States is a positive. I mean, is negative, excuse me. Um, and this is one of the biggest points. We really have to back up and say, why do we consider immigration over the southern border to be a negative thing? We know that the Labor Department reports every single quarter that there's a deficit of workers. We know that immigration has built the nation. We know that there have been no major terrorist attacks from people who have come over, immigrants who have come over the southern border. All this is a fact. The terrorist attacks are domestic terrorist attacks. You know, all these are facts, and yet this narrative persists that this is a crisis, that this is extremely dangerous for national security. There's no facts that really back that up. So we have to start saying, what's the real problem here? The problem is mm -hmm. that we do not have channels that integrate people who are coming into the country, many of whom are coming to be with their families. It's a right of children to grow up in families that have two parents. It's a right that we take for granted, and that many people who've been forced to immigrate out of these countries um, are, are not enjoying, their children are not having that right. Mm. And so we have to begin to look at what we would do in order to have an immigration policy that creates legal pathways yeah. to fill the labor demand and that prioritizes family reunification and uh, human rights. Mark, uh, to Laura's question on why does the United States see immigration across the southern border as a negative, I mean, if we look at a comparison, for instance, if we look at other developed countries around the world which are dealing with aging populations, um, longer lifespans, lower birth rates, that's impacting uh, economies in those countries. It's impacting retirement funds. It's impacting health care costs as well. Um, the United States has largely avoided these kinds of problems because of immigration. So given the positive outcomes that have already, uh, we've already seen, why not encourage immigration? Uh, I don't know. Let's have Congress debate that. That's not what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the administration running its own ad hoc extra legal immigration program. During this less, almost three years of the, Bi of the Biden administration, uh, the administration has taken into custody and then let go into the United States three million illegal border crossers. 
It is now earlier in the uh, segment you had, uh, your reporter had said that most immigrants are legal. And generally, when you look at the whole immigrant population, that's true. But over the past three years, the majority of immigration is illegal. So entering the United States illegally is now the main way of immigrating under the Biden administration. And if you want to make a case that we need increased immigration, I will argue against it, mm -hmm. but that's a separate debate. The Congress is the one that decides what the limits, what the caps, what the characteristics are of people being allowed into the United States. And this administration is simply ignoring that and, run, and basically freelancing yeah. its own immigration policy. And that has to stop no matter what we do on legal immigration. Right, Mark, let me just try and get some clarification on one, one point that you there's, made there. There's a serious question Excuse here, me, though. I didn't speak up when you were giving uh, false information about uh, most migrants going to New York coming from Texas. Most migrants coming to New York are not coming through the Texas busing program. So let him ask his question and I'll answer it. Okay, sorry, Laura, you wanted to say something. Go ahead and then I'll ask that. Question. Oh, yeah, it's just a quick point of clarification because the people who are let go are actually people who have gone through and, yeah. and into an asylum hearing. So they're waiting for asylum. And it was actually a point that, that he made at the beginning that these people are accessing the asylum system. But so that's not illegal. There's an international and a national right to asylum seeking. Some of them, yeah. first of all, their entrance is illegal. You yeah. can't apply for asylum unless you're an illegal alien through nope. defensive nope. asylum. By definition, you are an illegal alien. And no. many of them no. do not apply. Legally, that's not true. And Mark, you're not a lawyer, so that's not right. Asylum many is written in the code for people uh, to apply. The only way to apply for asylum is in the United States. People who appear at the border present themselves for asylum are going through the legal process. You clearly stated that Congress is the party that decides immigration, and they haven't decided immigration for 30 years. So they're the party that needs to decide the law. So it's not the president that has failed us. It is Congress that has failed us. We've had three different presidents through three different crises of immigration with no Congress doing anything. So the concept Cong that the president is running a system that Congress has no control over, okay. that Congress funds, is a misstatement. Congress can only fund up to 400,000 deportations a year. That's within the budget. So if there are 11 million people who are undocumented and Congress is in control, then why aren't they funding for it? So stop the fictions and let's okay. deal with the realities. Immigration is useful. And the reason that people are undocumented is because our system is broken yeah. and people would do it the legal way if we had enough avenues. All right, Mark, a Congress quick, a quick response from you, Mark, and then I'm going to move on. Is yeah. itself an action. Go ahead and ask your question. No, no, the, the question that I was going to ask was the one that Laura raised, because when you said that the majority of the people coming in are illegal, how would they be illegal if the law allows them, entitles them to stay and wait for their cases to be adjudicated? When you, when you cross the border illegally, if you are then taken into custody, you turn yourself in or you're, or you're arrested, and you are put into what is called expedited removal. It's yeah. supposed to be a quick way of removing people. If you say that you fear return, yeah. you are then put into a process that eventually leads to asylum. But you are an illegal immigrant put into deportation proceedings, right. during which you then say, don't deport me because I want asylum. Right. You, by definition, have to be an illegal alien who has no right to be in the United States. Rafael, looking at the political situation again, recently, uh, both the New York Times and the Washington Post, which are liberal newspapers, uh, published articles urging the president to compromise with Republicans on this particular issue, to give in on some of the things that separate them, um, and to accept Republican proposals on toughening border security. Um, what does this tell us when we hear these calls coming from quarters that are largely supportive of the Democrats? I, I would tell you, first of all, if you ask the immigration advocacy world about the New York Times and Washington Post on, on immigration specifically, they would not call them liberal. They have, they have a pretty long record of taking very, um, sort of very gray area, very centrist positions, very uh, positions that would be very comfortable for, for what Chris Murphy's negotiating right now. Yeah. So it's they, those papers are very liberal on domestic issues. They tend to take a much more, um, not much more centrist, uh, you know, somebody would accuse them of being neocons. I would not, but, but uh, I'd say that just to, to give an image of the image that those papers have on this topic among the uh, immigration advocacy world. So 
but th there is there is that fear coming from the left, um, it, and it's sort of split into into two parts. The, there's there's the left that wants compromise because wants this yeah. issue of, off the table. It's bad for Biden. And then there's the left, the, like the Hispanic Caucus and the progressives, that say this is our issue. We want to lean into it. We want to we want to bring more people in legally, and we want the president to to say what we're saying. And that that's a that's a big divide in the Democratic Party right now. Laura, there are those who oppose high levels of immig immigration who say that tightening the rules will discourage people from coming to the southern border. Um, do you think tougher rules will actually act as some kind of deterrent? Well, it's certainly not what we've seen in the history of immigration. Uh, there, have been, there have been highs and lows, there have been fluctuations, there have been the changes in the flows from what countries the, of origin they're coming, and, and we've talked about that. But deterrence, the only thing it's done is to criminalize immigrants, mm -hmm. which means that instead of coming up with their cousins or someone who's made the trip before, they're forced into the hands of organized crime. And now we have a situation where cartels and organized crime, because they've created human beings and human mobility as a black market are making more money than ever. And this this is really an, a national and national security threat for all of our countries. And yet it's actually caused by those tougher immigration rules. So if you if you loosen it up, if you respect human rights, then families can migrate, they can yeah. have different options and they can weigh their options. And also you have to start looking at what's happening in those countries. Yeah. Alan, very quickly, I've only got uh, well less than a minute right now, but can the United States adopt a system like the one that is used in Canada or the one that is used in Australia. Very selective criteria, tougher criteria. They look at things that, like higher education, language proficiency, uh, things like that. What, what would that do? We don't need to change the criteria necessarily. We just need to have a better process, an updated process that's not on paper and that goes through. People who have come to the border are intending immigrants, just like people who walk into embassies to apply for visas. So there's nothing illegal about that. And people, immigrants who are not in the United States can't be illegal by definition mm -hmm. or undocumented by definition. So those things are, are bizarre. I think looking for a new car is part of the problem that we have in our system to start from scratch. What we need to do is fund the system appropriately. Mm -hmm elevate the numbers and allow for the process to work. We're too busy thinking about keeping people out yeah. and improving the process. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnon Naidu in Washington, D.C.